So in the last class, we were working on example three and all we had done so far was basically talked out the scenario about how the plane is traveling in one direction um, into the headwind, which basically means against the headwind, right? Um, and then they were taking four hours and 24 minutes, which is about 4.4 hours. But then on the return flight, the airplane is traveling the same distance, but they're taking four hours only, okay? And they wanted us to find the rate of the plane or the speed of the plane and then the speed of the wind. And so we talked about how one, we were gonna have to use this formula in some way or another, right? Um, your distance is your speed times your time, or in some books, they call it the rate time time. And then we talked about this situation where when you're going into the headwind, that you're flying against the wind. So the wind is like pushing back on you, slowing you down. So you actually have to subtract the wind's speed from your plane's speed because it's gonna slow your plane down. Whereas when you're traveling with the wind, the wind is basically like giving you a little push, right? And so then your speed is gonna be a little bit faster. So you're gonna take the plane speed and you're gonna add the wind speed and that helps you go that much faster, okay? And then they just drew some little diagrams to show you the difference if you can't visualize this part, right? Okay, let's keep going though. So we already know that the distance is the rate times the time. And so if we're gonna take our equations, the total distance is 2000, right? So for the, um, for the, for the first trip, it's 2000 and then times this. Now where, oh, I'd already converted this to 4.4, didn't I? They're just converting it to 4.4. So for me, if I were writing the distance against the wind and then with the wind. So against the wind, I am traveling 2000 um, miles and my rate is going to be my plane's rate minus my wind's rate. And then the time that it took me was 4.4 hours, right? And if you type this in your calculator, you're gonna get that same 4.4. That's how I got it, right? I did 24 over 60 in my calculator and I got 0.4 and then I just added it to the four hours that was already there. With the wind, they say when you're returning, well, if you're returning, you're going the same exact distance then, aren't you? So notice that the distance is 2000 for this one as well. However, when I'm going with the wind, the wind is gonna help speed up my rate. And on that trip, it only took them four hours, okay? Once they had this, it looks like I wouldn't have done this, but it looks like what they did was they kept this as a fraction and then multiplied both sides by whatever the common denominator was. This would not have been my equation. My equation one would have been 2000 and then 4.4 R1 minus 4.4 R2. I don't like decimal, I mean fractions. So if I can avoid fractions, I usually try to. And I'd much rather use a decimal than a fraction, okay? Now I'm gonna write it right underneath this one. Um, and my equation, actually no, this equation would have been 2000 equal to 4R1 minus 4R2. So all I'm doing essentially is distributing my 4.4 and distributing my four. <coughs> Excuse me. So of course my steps are gonna look a lot different from theirs, but this section is the elimination section. So remember the goal for the elimination section. Oh, I made an error. Does anybody know where my error is? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. I distributed that four, but then somehow I got a negative, right? Be careful. Okay. So for elimination method, we need to make the coefficients the same, but opposite signs, right? So one of them has to be positive and one of them has to be negative. Now I do already have that situation here. 
The only thing I don't have is that these numbers are not exactly the same. So when I combine them, they're not going to cancel. And that's the whole point of elimination method, right? Is to eliminate it. So they do need to have the same number. The fastest, easiest way to do it, if we have opposite signs, is to take that coefficient and multiply it to the top equation, and then take the other guy's um, coefficient and multiply it to the bottom equation. And then what that will do is I'll make them both have a number now, but then one will be positive and one will be negative, right? So let's see what we get now. Um, I forgot my calculator, so let me grab this weird one. This is different from ours. Four times 2,000 is 8,000. And then four times 4.4 is 17.6. And I'm doing it again, changing the signs in the middle for no reason. There we go. So all I did was the top one. I just distributed this four to everybody. Now at the bottom, I'm gonna distribute the 4.4 to everybody. So 4.4 times 2,000. And then 4.4 times four be the same number. 17.6 R1 plus 17.6 R2. So when I combine them, something should be eliminating, right? And it's this one. Seven, negative 17.6 of these and positive 17.6 of these means I have no more R2, right? Those have been eliminated. And then over here, I'm gonna have 16,800 and whatever this is, 35.2 R1s. And then that's not too hard to solve for R1, right? You just divide by the 35.2 and you get R1 equal to 2. Um, normally it makes us round. I don't remember if it told us to round to something. Mm, it didn't, but it looks like they rounded to two decimal places. So I'm gonna round to two decimal places. So we get 427.27 because this third Two right here is not going to make the seven go up. Now the distance was in miles and the time was in hours. So this speed is gonna be in miles per hour. So we do have one of the solutions. R1 is the airplane speed. R2 was the wind speed. If you forget, there's going to be a huge difference between the two. One's going to be like in the hundreds, right? Because go like hundreds of miles per hour. And the other one's probably going to be like around 30, right? Winds are usually around 30 miles per hour. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If you forget what R1 is and what R2 is, just remember that the wind speed is always going to be smaller than the plane speed. Okay. That's fantastic. I used my elimination. I found one of the answers. Once you eliminate and you get one answer, you can plug that back into either one of the original equations, okay? Now, before I started doing my elimination, these are the two equations that I had, right? In the pencil. So I can plug my R1 into either one of these equations that I have here in the pencil. And normally what I like to do is I, if I can avoid the negatives, I do, okay? So I'm actually gonna plug it into this one because then I'll have a positive R2. Okay, so I'm going to plug it into the bottom one. So 2000 equals four and R1 is going to become 4477.27 plus four R2. So I'm rewriting the same thing, just plugging in my number for R1. Now that I have that plugged in, I'm going to compute Four times four seven seven point two seven is one nine zero nine point zero eight. But to solve for the R two, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm.
So then I will get negative 90.92. No, not negative. It's because I typed it in backwards in my calculator. But the bigger number here is positive, right? So it should have been a positive. Now that goes away. I have 4R2. So the last step, divide by 4. So we get 22.73 equals R2. And that makes sense for the wind, how fast the wind is traveling. My is not going to be traveling on 22 miles. It has to go faster than that just to get off the runway, <laughs> the speedway. You can't even do that. Now, just to verify, they did do the, the equation pieces a little bit differently than I did. Um, I just like to do them more straightforward. I don't mind that there's decimals. I don't have to get fractions and get rid of the fractions and all that good stuff. But notice I did get the same two answers that they have, right? We got 477.27 and we got um, 22.73, okay? So even though my equations look different, they're equivalent, okay? They were okay. So that was the one big example that we had. Um, they're gonna start going into the practice. So we're gonna kind of get some, um, there's some weird things that are gonna happen now as we do these practices. But we're gonna start going into the practice. And when I get to the section, there's actually three problems in there, like word problems that I wanna do, okay? So we will see some more of those word problems. But let's go ahead and start with practice one. I think there's three, yeah. Because so far, all the problems we've been solving have always had a solution. But we know from last class that it is possible to have no solution. Rolando, can you grab this? Um, So we know that it's possible to have no solution, and we also know that it's possible to have infinitely many solutions, right? But every time we've been solving the problems, we have not come up to those situations yet, okay? And I think, I think what's going to happen in these next three problems is one of them, you're going to have a solution like we normally have. One of them is going to have no solution, so you can see what it looks like when you get no solution. And then the other one's gonna have infinitely many solutions. And you need to see what happens when you get that as well. So how would you know that those are gonna be the answers, right? So let's try this problem. It says solve this system and then make sure you enter, um, I don't know what that means. Enter for uh, X and enter, <laughs> in terms of A, oh, it says if the system is dependent, enter A for X and enter Y in terms of A. This is important, we will talk about it, if this is one of those problems where I have to do that, okay? And if the problem is no solution, we'll find out. Which of these letters would you think is the easiest one to eliminate? It is Y. They already have the opposite signs, don't they? And don't they already have the same coefficient as well? They do. So I can just combine them right off the bat. I don't even need to multiply anybody by anything, right? That's nice. So if I combine them, 3x and x is going to give me 4x. Positive y minus y is going to cancel. And then 6 minus 2 is 4. So if I'm solving for the x, I'm just gonna divide by four and I get X equal to one. This one can be plugged into any equation, but I need to find Y, right? So I like to plug it in the equation that has a positive Y, not the one with the negative Y, because then I'm gonna have to divide by the negative, right? Extra step, don't want to. So I'm gonna plug it in the top one. So three times one plus Y equals to six. So that gives me three, plus y equals x, and then that means y would have to be a three. And so then my answer, if the computer is telling me this, what's gonna go in the top box? 
And then what's going to go in the bottom box? Three. So this one is like a normal one we've been doing. They just tried to trick us by having them already ready, right? We didn't have to multiply by anything. Oh, are you still copying? You good? Okay. I post these later, so you can always get them in the canvas also. Um, backside. Here's the other one. This one's no solution. I already know. But how would you know, right? Which one of those do you want to eliminate? Because here, there is no easier one, right? The X's are both the same sign. The Y's are both the same sign, and they're not supposed to be. And none of the coefficients match on the X's or the Y's. So we're gonna have to multiply by something. So pick, you wanna get rid of X or do you wanna get rid of Y? You wanna get rid of Y, okay. So that means these guys have to have the same numbers in front, but they have to have opposite signs. This one is possible to do just by multiplying one equation by something. Which equation should I multiply and what should I multiply it by? Exactly. If I take this top one and I multiply it by a negative two, won't it give me a negative 12 here? Which is exactly what I need to wipe it out, right? So let's go see what we get. I'm gonna put it underneath after I distribute the negative two. So that's gonna make negative 14 X. This is gonna make negative 12 Y. And then that's gonna multiply to give me negative eight. And when I combine this new equation, right, which is equivalent to the top equation, when I take this new equation and I combine it with the second equation, the X's wipe out and the Y's wipe out. And I get 45 on this side. You have to have something on that side of the equation. What happens, what do you get? Both of them wipe out zero you have nothing right the numerical value of nothing okay so this is no solution because can zero equal 45 zero does not equal 45 which means i have no solution so when do you get a no solution you get no solution when all the variables eliminate and you are left with a false statement. Okay. So if you cancel everything and you get zero on one side, of course, because everything canceled, right? But you get something not zero on the other side, then it's just no solution. But then that leaves the question, well, what happens if you do get zero and zero, right? That's the case when you have infinitely many solutions, okay? But how you write your answer is really weird. So I'm gonna talk about that when we get to the next one, because the next one is gonna do just exactly that. So the next one is a infinitely many solutions problem. So here we're lucky because both X's and Y's have opposite signs, right? However, they don't match in coefficients. So you have to pick which one do you wanna get rid of X or do you wanna get rid of Y? We'll get rid of X this time. And you can just multiply one equation by something. This one's bigger, right? So it's probably the small one I need to multiply, right? 
And what do I need to multiply it by so that I get a, a negative 25? Positive five. So then let me write that down. I'm gonna have this top equation. It's not like the other one where I could just put it underneath. And then when I multiply these out, I get negative 25 X positive five Y and positive 20. So equation one is exactly the same. And then the bottom one is the equation two multiplied out. But then this time, right, they both, everything wipes out. So what do you have on the left side? Zero. And then what do you have on the right side? Zero. Now, it tells you what to do. It says enter A for X. So in my box, it's telling me what to enter for X. It's telling you to enter an A. So you have to enter the A. If you get zero and zero, this means there are infinitely many solutions. Now, I have to clarify this because there are people who get confused with this. There is a difference between telling you that there are an infinitely many number of solutions and telling you that everything is a solution because not everything is a solution, okay? The only things that are solutions are points that land right on top of these lines that overlap each other, right? They're the same line. So anything that lands on that line is a solution. If it's not on that line, it does not, it doesn't, it is not a solution to this system. Okay. So if I were to graph this guy, it would probably look like um, something like this. Okay. And then if I were to graph the bottom one, it's going to look the exact same, right? So any of the points along this line are solutions. But if I pick a point way over here, is that guy going to be a solution? No. And so what you need to tell them is how do I figure out what the solutions are? Because I can't just say that it's anything, right? What you can do is you can let X equal anything, right? And so what that does is it focuses you and says, well, if I pick an X value, right? Let's say I pick an X value over here. I can find the Y value that goes with it, right? That is on that line, okay? And how do you do that? You just plug A into any one of these equations and solve for Y. Which one of these two equations is easier to solve for Y? The bottom one. It has no coefficient and it's a positive Y, right? So when I take that, I'm gonna plug in this A. Negative five A, plus y equal to four. I don't really need the parentheses, do I? But if I want y by itself, I'm gonna have to add this 5a over. And so what I end up with is y equal to positive 5a plus four. And this is what needs to go into that box. If you have any other expression besides 5a plus four, you will get the problem wrong. And just to make a point, it doesn't matter if I would have plugged it into the other one. If I would have plugged in A into the top equation, I'm still gonna get that same expression, except I would have to minus 25A and then I'd have to divide of five. And you see already where it's going. I'd get a positive 5a and a positive 4, wouldn't I? So I'd get the same exact expression, even if I chose to plug a into the other guy. Okay. So that's what happens when you get an infinitely many solutions. And I do have some more word problems that I want to do from the homework before we keep going. Because we do want to start talking about 10.1 today. But I'm going to come over here and go to that homework so we can get those problems.
I want to do 12, 13, and 14. I think those are the last two. Or the last three, I'm sorry. Can't count. Yes. Okay. Actually, I don't want to do this one because isn't this number 12 exactly the same thing as the one we did in the example? If you're going to convert this to a decimal, what decimal is it going to be? Two hours and 30 minutes. 2.5, right? 30 divided by 60 is 0.5. So it'd be 2.5 hours. But you would do that one exactly like we did our example. Okay. So I'm not going to work on number 12 because we literally just did one like that. But I do want to do number 13 because that one is completely different. So this one says two planes start from Los Angeles International Airport and fly in opposite directions. So you've got one going in one direction and one going in the other direction. Um, the second plane starts one half hour after the first plane. I don't know which one's which. I'm going to just say one and two. I'll show you what I'm writing down. I just did this. I put LA in the middle and I drew one plane going in one direction and one plane going in the other direction, right? This is just a visual for me. <laughs> then I labeled the one going this way is going to be plane one and the one going that way is going to be plane two. Then they told me that the second one left half an hour later, okay? So whatever this guy's time is, his time is going to be half an hour later, right? So it's going to be T1 minus 0 0.5. Because he'll be driving for half an hour less, right? Or flying for half an hour less. Let's go see what else it tells me. It says, but its speed, since it's talking about the second plane, when it says, but it's, it means the second plane speed. So the speed is 40 kilometers per hour faster. So let me go back over here. So whatever his speed is, this guy's speed is gonna be faster. So it's gonna be speed one plus those 40 kilometers. Let's see what the next sentence tells us. It says, find the speed of each plane when two hours after the first plane departs and the planes are this many miles apart. Okay, so now it's telling me how many hours the first plane departed. So now I don't need to know this. I know this is two hours. And so that makes this what? How long would this guy be flying then if that guy flew for two hours? Not 2.5, 1.5 hours, because he left 30 minutes later, right? So he's flying 30 minutes less than the other guy. So if he flew for two hours and he left later, he's only gonna be flying for 1.5 hours, okay? But it does tell me that this distance is what number? Three one four zero. Three one four zero. Okay, so let's put all of this information together. Let's talk about plane one. We know that the distance equals the rate times the time. Now I don't know what the distance is, so I'm just going to write distance one equals his rate s one times his time, which is two. Then for plane two, I don't know his distance, but his is gonna be rate times time. So it's gonna be S1 plus 40 times his time, which is 1.5. And let's see, well, 1.5 S1 
plus 1.5 times 40. And I get 105. Now, here's another thing I know. I know that the total distance is 314 kilometers, which means that the D1 plus the D2, both of those guys' distances should equal 3140, right? If this one's going in this way, this one's going the other way, that total distance comes from his distance and his distance. I just don't know what they are individually. And considering that that one left earlier and is going faster, they're definitely not the same. So I'm gonna actually use substitution. I'm gonna take, instead of D1 in this equation, I'm gonna actually plug in what do we have for D1, which is 2S1. And then instead of D2, I'm gonna plug in what we have for D2, which is 1.5 S1 plus 105. And that total distance should equal the 3140. How do I solve this? Because I do only have one variable. It's S1. Combine my like terms. So that means I have 3.5 S1s. So then I'm going to solve for S1 by minusing 105 and then eventually dividing by 3.5. And I get S1 equals 867.14. Normally WebAssign tells you how to round but if it doesn't, I usually just go two places, but let me go check real quick. Um, it doesn't tell me. Mm -mm. So I just put in two decimals then, if it doesn't tell you how to round. <clears throat> so this is the speed of the first airplane, right? Then how do I figure out what the speed of the second airplane is? Do I have an equation anywhere on here that tells me what S2 is? And I can use S1 to find S2. Do you see an equation anywhere on there? Because you've got equations up here, you've got equations down here, right? Which one tells you what S2 is with relation to S1? Mm -hmm, at the very top, right? This guy. Doesn't that one tell you what S2 is? Once you know S1? So that's what we're going to do. To find S2, we're going to take the S1 value we found, and we're going to add 40. And I get 907.14 for S2. And so now we know both of their times. Now they did tell us hours. And they did tell us kilometers. So this should be kilometers per hour. That one was from the paragraph and it said that the speed, I'll read it to you. It says the second airplane starts a half hour after the first one, but its speed is 40 miles per hour faster. And so that's why we had that, you would have to add 40 to the speed. And it came out true, right? Isn't my second plane faster than my first plane, right? So that one was a little bit weird, but I like to just talk it out and then see what we have to figure out what to do from there. Okay, number 14, I'm sure it's different. Let's go see what that one looks like. So this one's like way different. 
I want cheeseburgers. It says two cheeseburgers and one small order of fries contains a total of 1,490 calories. Three cheeseburgers and two small orders of French fries, or it just says fries, and I put French in there, <laughs> contains a total of 2,400 calories. It says find the calorie, cal I can't say that, caloric content of each item, okay? Oh gosh, I don't remember these numbers. So it said two cheeseburgers and one small fry equals 1490 calories. And then three cheeseburgers and two small fries is 2400 calories. So I just wrote this down. I didn't even put it in equations yet although I put equals, but it's not an equation. That's the and symbol. So if I put this in equations, we're gonna have to pick letters. I'm just gonna choose B and F for burgers and fries, okay? So two burgers, once I know how many calories the burgers are, I can multiply it by two plus one fry. Once I know the calories for the fries, I'll multiply it by one. And when I add those together, I should get the 1490. But then three burgers and two fries should be the 2400 calories. Which of these letters is the easiest to eliminate? The F is the easiest. It is. Um, because then I would only have to multiply the top equation by something. What should I multiply the top equation by? Negative two. So it will have the same number in the front, but it'll have a negative, right? So I'm going to get negative 4B. I'm going to get negative 2. And I'm going to get negative 2980. So when I combine the two things, I'm going to get one negative B. F's are gone, and negative 580. Then I just have to divide by the negative one coefficient, and I get B is positive 580. So one burger is going to cost, or is going to be 580 calories. Then we can plug that number back into any one of the equations. Which equation from the first two, which one would you plug it into to find F? It doesn't matter, but pick one. Top. Sure, the top one. So we're going to get 2 times 580 plus just one fry equals 1490. And one fry is just an F, right? And so then we're subtract, and we get that the fries are 330 calories. That was probably the easier of the word problems, right? Because it's very straightforward. Okay, now we finally get to talk about matrices. Finally, right? Well, this is the last chapter in the whole book. Anna, I'm so sorry. My eye is so swollen with allergies and it keeps watering. Um, okay, so matrices, I don't even know if you know what a matrix looks like. Do you know what a matrix looks like? And I don't mean the little green numbers that come down in the Matrix movie. <laughs> Do you know what a matrix looks like? What does it look like? Yes, yes. It, it depends on which book you use. Some of them use these symbols to encompass the matrix. 
And some people use a giant parentheses to encompass a matrix. It really doesn't matter what symbol you use on the outside, right? But you do have a certain number of columns and then a certain number of rows, okay? So there will be numbers throughout these things, okay? Now, in order for me to tell you how big a matrix is, like it's, its size, right? I wanna know, is it a big one like this or is it a little one with just like four little numbers like that? Is it a tall one where I just have one column with a bunch of numbers in it, right? What is the size of this matrix, okay? The size is actually called um, the dimensions. So if you see a problem that asks you, what is its dimensions? It's asking you how big it is, like how wide and how tall it is, okay? Um, it says in this section, da, 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 da. what is it saying? Oh, it's just an array, a rectangular array of real numbers called the matrix and then plural, it's called matrices, not matrices, matrices. So that's what it looks like. And the ones that go downward are your columns, okay? And the ones that go across horizontally are your rows. So when you're counting your um, dimensions, you always want to count across so you can get the number of columns you have across. And then you want to count the number of rows you have going downward, which is opposite from the way they look, where they appear, and how you're counting, right? Because the columns go downward, but you're counting across. And the rows go across, but you're counting downward, right? To see how many of those rows you've got. So it's a little bit backwards. And because of that, there's always lots of errors. Um, only thing I can tell you is just remember to count how many, how many columns you have across first, then how many rows. So notice that they said they have this many number of columns and this many number of rows. And look at the way they write the size, okay? They write the number of columns or the number of rows first and then the number of columns. So actually you count downward first and then across. So I'll give you this one. I not have numbers in there, but how many rows does it have? Four rows. And then how many columns does it have? Just one column. What about if I give you one that looks like this? How many rows does it have? Two. And how many columns does it have? Two. So we're looking at this. These are the two rows, and then these are the two columns, right? Now, what about this one just for one more? How many rows are there? Four rows. And how many columns? Three. Okay, there are problems like that in the homework and even on the final that literally just ask you the dimensions. Okay, so knowing which way to count them is super important. Okay. Um, now they do, there's got to be a way. <laughs> if I'm telling you I'm talking about that guy, there's got to be another way to say it than that guy, right? Because that's not very descriptive, just saying that number right there in the matrix, that's not going to be helpful. And especially if you have like, you know, different numbers all over the place and you have like a two up here and a two down here. How do I tell the person I'm looking at the two up there and not the two down there, right? There's gotta be a way to identify each entry, okay? And so they do call these numbers that go inside entries. So I didn't even mention that, it says it up here. But um, each of those little guys in there are called entries and they have labels to help you identify which entry you're talking about. And so notice the, the notation that they use. They always put the row number first and then the column number next. So if I'm talking about A11, that means I'm talking about the number in the first row and the first column. Because if I'm talking about this guy, I'm talking about the entry that's in the third row, but the second column. Okay, so it's super important that you understand that whenever you see the entries, it's always going to be the row number first and then the column number. And then that tells you exactly where you are at. Okay. I don't use that notation 
but you're going to see it a lot when they talk about certain things. And so I need you to know what, what it means. Okay. So just like this one, it means that this guy is going to be in the second row, but the third column, right? Um, and a matrix that has one row is called a row matrix. And a matrix that has only one column is called the column matrix. So this guy right here was a column matrix, right? If I would have had a matrix like this, that one would have been called the row matrix, okay? And it has only one row, but it does have three columns. Okay, and then a matrix having M rows and N columns, whatever number it is, is said to have this order, okay? So they're calling it order in this book. It's also called dimensions in other books. And it's also called size in other books. So if you hear me say dimension, size, or order, I'm talking about the exact same thing, okay? And web assigned too. If they choose to use another word besides the word order, they choose to use one of these two words, it's the same thing, okay? How many rows and how many columns does the bad boy have, right? That's it. Okay. You are considered a square matrix when your rectangle looks like a square. How's it going to look like a square? Only if you have the same number of rows as you do columns. So these things, for instance, are square matrices. Okay. Don't they have the exact same number of rows as they do columns? So it would make the rectangle look more like a square. I know that one doesn't really, but you get the idea. So here we are first kind of example. How do we find this? It's only got one row and one column, doesn't it? It's a one by one. How many rows does this one have? Just one, but how many columns? Four. How many rows does this one have? And how many columns? Two. What about this last one? Rows, three, and columns, two. Exactly. So it's not too bad, right? There are some problems in the homework that are like that and on the test and on the final. So those are, are good ones, <laughs> some easy points, right? Okay, now here's where we start getting into how is this stuff gonna apply to us, right? What do we need to know this for? In all of those sections that we were talking about the systems of equations, we were only solving two equations with two variables, okay? And so they looked a lot like this. I'm just making something up, okay? They look like that, right? I told you that there was another way to solve systems when they look like this. We just hadn't gotten to it yet because we haven't talked about chapter 10 yet. You can turn this into a matrix, okay? Just like you can turn a bigger system, which we also have not solved, but we will be able to now, you can turn that one into a matrix, okay? When you turn a system of equations into a matrix, it's called an augmented matrix. There are problems in your homework, there's a problem on the test, and there's a problem on the final that literally just tells you to make the augmented matrix. That's it. And it is so super straightforward. As long as you have all the X's, all the Y's, and all the Z's, and then your equal signs, and all your constants on the other side, as long as all the equations look like that, it's literally just picking out the numbers, okay? So for instance, in this one, the matrix would be, what's the coefficient for this X? One, this guy's coefficient? Four. Almost. Negative four. This guy's coefficient? Three. And then over here, it's just a constant five. Now what I like to do is I like to draw a line here for my equal sign. So this column is gonna tell you the X coefficients. This column is gonna tell you the Y coefficients. This column is gonna show you the Z coefficients. And then this side is your equal and your constant, okay? So for the next equation, it's gonna be a negative one coefficient, a positive three coefficient, a negative one coefficient, and then a negative three constant. This one's tricky. X coefficient is a two, 
z coefficient is a negative four and the constant is a six. You cannot leave an entry blank. So what do I put in there? Exactly. There are no y's, right? So you have to fill it in with the zero. That's it. I mean, those are gonna be nice problems on the final. So for this one, if I draw the line for my equal sign, my numbers would be one, negative four, five, two, three, and seven. And that's the augmented matrix, okay? Oh, they just did it for me. Oh, this is the augmented matrix. I drew a line, I didn't draw that, I just did this, right? It's the same thing. I just drew a line to represent the equal sign, okay? Um, if you ignore the constants and you just talk about the coefficients, it's called the coefficient matrix, okay? We don't use the coefficient matrix too much, but it will pop up in like one problem that we have to do or that we have to talk about, okay? But we don't typically do a whole bunch with this. We're gonna do a whole bunch with the augmented matrix though. Okay. It says, note the use of zero for the missing coefficient of the y variable in the third equation. And also note the fourth column of constant terms in the augmented matrix. When performing either the coefficient matrix or the augmented matrix when forming of a system, you should begin by vertically aligning all the variables in the equations and using zeros for the coefficients of the missing variables. I already mentioned that, right? When you have your equations, you need to have all the x's, all the y's, if you have z's, all the z's, then your equal signs, and then your constants, right? They have to look like that in order for you to put it in the matrix. If they don't, you might have to mess around with them a little bit. Look at these three things again. They're the same thing that we saw before when we were solving, uh, when we were doing the elimination method, okay? There are what were called row operations. And in the row operations, you can interchange any two rows, just like you can interchange any two equations when you're solving systems. Interchanging two rows is denoted by this. So let's say I had a row one and a row two, and I wanna swap them. I'm gonna say row one is gonna get swapped with row two, okay? That's how I tell you what I'm doing. It is not required to tell me what you're doing, but I can guarantee you it is super helpful for me and super helpful to you to write what you're gonna do. Because I can promise you, you're not gonna get all these problems right the first time you do them. You're not, I didn't, I got them all wrong all the time, a lot <laughs> before I started getting them right, okay? And the one thing that I had to remember to get them right is to not go so fast. I kept trying to like, quickly hurry up and do it and then I'm just putting all the wrong numbers in the wrong places I'm doing the wrong things it's just it was a mess okay so just don't go fast slow down take it step by step and just your way through it don't try to rush it okay um, the next thing that I can do with the regular systems is I could multiply any equation by a non-zero number right I can do the same thing with the whole row and to tell you what I'm going to do I always say whatever the number is, let's say I wanna multiply everybody by negative two. Then I'm gonna say negative two times row three, okay? And that's how I'm gonna write what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do negative two times row three. That way, when you read back, when you get the answer wrong, <laughs> you can go look at your steps and say, what was I supposed to do? And then did I actually do it correctly? And then the next step, what was I supposed to do? And did I actually do it correctly? Because sometimes you never know. You might be multiplying by a negative two, but your brain's like, no, I'm going to divide by two. And you write the wrong number down, right? It happens. Last thing that we could do for the elimination method was we could add a multiple of any equation to another equation, okay? That's important too. So, but I want to mention something, and I didn't mention it here. Let's say I wanted to do negative two times row three, but I wanted to add row one, okay? This result is going to release one of those rows, 
Okay. Cause you got, why would you do it? If it's not going to go in somewhere, right? You're going to do it so that it can replace somebody. How do you know which one it's going to replace? It has to, you do not have a choice. It has to replace one that did not get multiplied by anything. Okay. So when I do that, I always go like this and I say, that's going to become my new row one. And then when I do this, I say, that's going to become my new row three because I was only messing around with row three, right? On that step. But this one, it's already straightforward. You're swapping them, right? Two is gonna become one and one's gonna become two. So you're gonna see me write these things on my paper when I start getting into the um, elimination method with the matrix, okay? So this is just an example, right? Here's your original matrix. And they're telling you that they're gonna swap row one and row two. And that's exactly what they did. Didn't all of these numbers move down a row? And all of those numbers went up, didn't they? Okay, so they're just showing you what it looks like when you swap it, okay? It's an equivalent matrix. Now, what happens if we do um, multiply one of the rows by something? It says multiply the first row by something. So that means row one is getting multiplied by one half. So they're taking all of these guys from row one and multiplying them by a half. Notice that, and I have to mention this, notice that when they gave us the three things we could do, they never told me that I could subtract or that I could divide, right? They never said that. You can and you can't. <laughs> you can't technically, but in reality you can because isn't subtraction just the addition of a negative number, right? And isn't division just the multiplication of a reciprocal, okay? So really what they're doing is they're taking all of these numbers and they're dividing them by two, right? Isn't two divided by two, one? This guy divided by two is this guy. That guy divided by two is that guy and so on, right? But instead of saying row one divided by two, notice how they write it. They write it as a reciprocal times the row two, okay? So you are actually dividing, but it, you don't write it like you're dividing, okay? So I just wanna mention that because when I start saying divide everybody by five, and then I write one fifth <laughs> times it, you know that's the same thing, right? Dividing by five and multiplying by one fifth are the same thing. Okay, now this one is important. They're doing negative two times the first row. So negative two times row one um, of the original matrix to the third row. So we're gonna add that to the third row. Just looking at that, all I did was write their sentence in symbols. Who's the row that's going to get replaced? So I'm going to do a new row what? Three, the one that did not get multiplied by something, okay? It has to be the one you did not multiply by something. So since you multiplied row one by something, that is not the guy you're going to replace, okay? You got to replace it by the other one. So that's why down here, notice they have the answer at the bottom, right? Now, I like to do this on the side. When I'm gonna do something like this, where I have to put two matrices, there, I cannot just tell you the answer. I'm not that good, okay? I do that. So what I do is I like to take all the guys in row one and multiply them by negative two. This is my negative two row one. Then I'm gonna write the row three right underneath it. And since I'm adding these two things together, I'm just gonna add all of these guys together. So I get zero, negative three, 13, and negative eight. And this becomes my new row three. So all I'm gonna do is rewrite row one, rewrite row two, but then row three becomes all of these numbers, okay? So you do have to do side work with these problems, okay?
Now, they are doing elimination here. Didn't They're eliminating this first guy, right? Didn't you have a two and you had a one? How can you make them eliminate? Only if they match the same number, but with opposite signs, which is what we were just doing, right? So what do I need to multiply that guy by so that I get a two, but a negative two? You would have to multiply it by negative two, wouldn't you? And then you'd wanna add that one so that you can wipe it out. And so that's exactly what happened and they wiped out, didn't they? So you are doing the elimination method. It's just different because you don't have all the variables in the way, okay? Now, here's, there's two different kinds of elimination. There's Gaussian elimination, which is basically, excuse my language, but it's basically a half-ass version of the Gauss-Jordan elimination, okay? The Gaussian elimination basically makes you get this. It makes you get a matrix and you have to have ones here and you have to have zeros here. It doesn't care what the numbers are here, here, and here. And of course, whatever these numbers are, not a big deal either. That's the goal. You want to get it reduced down, eliminate, do all the elimination stuff, reduce it down until it looks like this. Once you have it looking like this, you already know these are your X's, these are your Y's, these are your Z's, and these are your constants. So this literally tells you no X's, no Y's, but one Z equals whatever that number is. Then you would take that answer and you would plug it in and you would write this as an equation, plug it in, then the next one, plug it in and so on and so forth. I don't like that method just because, I don't know, it just, there's no, <laughs> you're likely to make mistakes regardless, okay? So whether you're using the Gosh Jordan elimination and you're doing this, you can make mistakes going up that way. Or if you do the Gosh Jordan elimination, which they probably don't give me, do they give it to me? Yes, they do. Okay. The Gosh Jordan elimination is where you get one zero 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 one zero 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 one, and then whatever your numbers are here. The reason why this one might also give you the risk of getting the wrong answers is because the process is not longer, right? You have three other numbers you gotta turn to zero. And of course, the more operations you have to do, the more likely you can make a mistake. The cool thing about this one is when you're done, X equals that number, Y equals that number, and Z equals that number, right? You don't have to do any of the back substitution stuff, okay? When it's Gauss Jordan elimination. Okay, I actually wrote this on the wrong page. And just like before, there is a way to tell if you're gonna get an actual answer, a no solution, or infinitely many solutions. But we're not gonna get there yet. Let's, let's just first work with some that work <laughs> and then we'll talk about those weird ones. Okay. Now they do not tell you, or do they? Let's see. Um, it's saying it is worth noting that row echelon form of a matrix is not unique. That is that two different sequences of row elementary row operations may yield different row echelon forms. However, the reduced row echelon form of a given matrix is unique. Okay, essentially what that's telling you is that it doesn't matter if you do your operations different from my operations, we will still get the same answer. Okay, as long as you're going through the process and you're doing it all the way to the end, you will still get the same answer as me, even if you choose to do this first and that next and all of that. Okay, however, it is super possible to do stuff and then to undo it, and then to do it again, and then to undo it again, and you just keep going around in circles, okay? To avoid that from happening, to avoid you from changing something to a zero and then trying to change something else to a zero, and then you undo the zero you already have, okay? So let's say you add two things together, you do the elimination, you eliminate, 
the x coefficient, right? And so now you have a zero there, which is great. We want to have that. But then when you go to eliminate another variable, you have to add that equation again, and then the zero now turns into a different number. You basically undid all that work you did to turn it into a zero, didn't you? This can happen. And if you don't choose the operations that you do carefully and the order in which you do them, you can be here forever and never get the answer, okay? So my key, and I'm hoping that they mention it to you because if not, I don't understand why these books don't mention this, but I guess they just want you to play with them enough to like realize, but we don't got that kind of time. So <laughs> there is a way to do it. And it says, what you should do is operate from left to right by columns using the row operations to obtain zeros and all entries directly below the leading ones. Let me explain this better. This does not make sense to me. Does that make sense to you? No, right? <laughs> I swear half the part of being a teacher is just putting what they say in like real words <laughs> that people can understand. So the goal is to make it look like this. And then of course you're gonna have whatever you end up with over here, right? I don't know what those are gonna be, but they're gonna be numbers, okay? This is what you need to do first. You need to get this guy first. You need to make him a one first. That guy needs to be a one first. Once you have that one, make these guys zeros. Now, which one you do second and which one you do third doesn't matter, but just to stay consistent, I'm gonna say do that one second and do that one third. Once you have this whole column completed, then you can move on to the next column, okay? But when you go to the next column, you have to get the one to be a one first before you can get the zeros to be a zero, okay? That means that I have to work on this one next, okay? And then the other two, it doesn't really matter the order, but just because I'm gonna go downward, I'm gonna call this one the fifth one, and this one, the sixth one. These two, doesn't matter the order, and these two, it doesn't matter the order. What matters is you get that one first, and you make the other two guys zeros. Finally, the last column, you have to get this one here first, and then you can move on to the other two guys. And again, these, doesn't matter what order. When you're done with all of that, these numbers will be whatever they will be, okay? They're just, they're consequential, okay? After doing everything you're supposed to be doing with this stuff, this stuff magically ends up being the answer, okay? So that's the game plan. Get the ones to be ones first in the column, then use that one to get zeros. Then you can move over to the next column. Get the one to be a one, then the zeros, then move over to the last column. Get the one to be a one, then get the zeros. Okay, here's another thing worth mentioning. How do I get things to turn to ones and how do I get things to turn to zeros, okay? Ones are easy. To get ones, you multiply by the reciprocal of the entry you are turning into a one. By definition, when you take a number, whatever that number is, and you multiply by its reciprocal, it's gonna give you a one, isn't it? Okay, so if you wanna get a one, just multiply by the reciprocal of that number that you're trying to turn into a one, okay? To get zeros, you're going to, you add the row to a multiple of the row you made one. That still doesn't make sense, but there's no other way I can explain it. You, that one, you really have to like see it, okay? So if I turn this guy into a one, because that's the first one I got to work with, right? If I turn that guy into a one, I'm basically going to take 
if I wanna turn this guy into a zero, I'm gonna take this row and I'm gonna add it to a multiple of that row, okay? And when I do that, if I choose that multiple clever enough, it will eliminate this variable, okay? So let's go see some of these in action because they're super, super complicated. Oh God, do they do them right? Yes, they do. I'm gonna do this by hand because I really want to have all the answers there. That is not how it works. No, this is a big one, I'm just gonna read it, okay. So they say solve this system. Now we have definite, we haven't even done three variables and three equations, have we? This one has four variables and four equations. This one, just to be honest from experience, is a nightmare to try to solve using elimination method. It's just insanity. You have to basically take these two, eliminate a variable, take these two, eliminate a variable, take these two, eliminate a variable. And then you take the two together from the three and make eliminate a variable, then take these two, eliminate another variable. It's just, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. It's ridiculous. So this elimination method is definitely gonna help us. Now, let's look. There's no X, so we put a zero. One Y, a one, Z, a one, negative two W, a negative two. There's your equals bar and then the negative three. Here we have one, two, negative one, no w's, and then the two. Two, four, one, negative three, and then the negative two. And then the last equation, one, negative four, negative seven, negative one, negative 19. So when you do this correctly, there should be no more letters in your matrix, okay? None, there are never letters in there. You're engineers, right? You'll see letters in there later, <laughs> not yet. Remember I told you I'll do imaginary stuff, right? When you put the matrix and the imaginaries together, you get electrical engineering. That's how it works, <laughs> okay? So if that's your major, you'll be seeing matrices with imaginaries and all that. We won't, but you might later. Okay, so the first thing they wanna do is they wanna make the top guy a one. Now, just FYI, there's no reciprocal of zero, is there? If I put one over zero, that's an undefined number, isn't it? So you cannot ever, 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 ever change a zero into a one. If you have a zero in a spot where you want the one to be, you have no choice, but you're gonna have to switch those rows around, okay? And you actually have two choices here because doesn't this one already have a one and that one already have a one in the front? So I could have swapped these two rows or I could have swapped those two rows. It really wouldn't have mattered. All that would have happened is I would have had the one in the right spot, okay? It looks like they chose to switch row one and row two. So they literally just took this whole row and put it at the bottom and took the second row and put it at the top, okay? Not much going on, they just swapped them. That gives me the one right there where I need to have it, okay? Then I'm supposed to use that one to change the rest to zeros. Okay, you can do them at the same time, which they did, but <laughs> they like magically know how to do this stuff because I can't. Um, this one's already a zero, so you don't have to worry about changing it. This one is not a zero. What do I need to add to a two to get it to zero? A minus two, a negative two, right? So notice what they're doing is they're taking negative two times row one because that would turn him into a negative two, wouldn't it? And then when I add it to the row three, it should give me zero in that spot, okay? But how the heck do you get all the other numbers? I'll talk about it in a second. Then this one, I want to make this go away also. So I'm gonna need a negative one, aren't I? So I multiply a negative one, it's an imaginary one, but a negative one times row one, and then I can add row four, and that will give me a one and a negative one, and I will get that zero. But how do I get all the other numbers, right? They're not telling us, <laughs> they're telling us what they're doing, but they're not showing us like exactly how they got these numbers. So let me do this one here on the side in pink, okay? So negative two times row one is going to be negative two, negative four, positive two, zero, and negative four. 
Then if I add row three right underneath that, you can see that I'm gonna get zero, zero, three, negative three, and negative six. Isn't that what they have? Do they have the same thing as me? Yeah, but they didn't show you like all the work they did to get that. They just were like, here it is, magic. <laughs> it's not okay. So now let's try the other one. So now we're gonna do negative row one. So negative, negative one, negative two, this will turn to positive one, zero, still zero. And that will turn to a negative two. Then I'm gonna add row four. So one, negative four, negative seven, negative one, and negative me. And what do we get? We get zero, we get negative six. Those also give me negative six a negative one, and that gives me negative 21. And now you can see where they got all these answers, right? Make sure you see it, because I cannot keep going unless you see what I'm doing. I got about 10 more minutes to do whatever we're gonna do. Okay, next one is, that's fantastic. They did get, oh, I need to get a matrix, where'd it go? They finished column one, didn't they? They did two steps in one, which is totally okay, but now they're gonna work with this column, okay? Now, remember, the goal is to get this diagonal of ones, okay? That's the goal. And right now, you've only worked with this column and you made that guy a one right? But we used it to make these guys zeros. Then you move over to the second column. I want to make this guy a one. Okay. But it's already a one, isn't it? So I don't need to do anything to it. I don't have to make it a one. It's good to go. However, I need to use that second row to turn this into a zero and to turn that into the zero. The other guy's already a zero, right? So let's think about it. If you want to change, um, I don't like what they did here. So I'm gonna have to do this from here. Let me cross this out and cross this out and we'll just pay attention to the solution at the end. I'm gonna actually write this out. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use this. What am I going to multiply this by to turn that to a zero? It has to be the same number, right? But the opposite sign. So I'm going to take negative two times row one, and then I'm going to, or sorry, that's the wrong one. Negative two times row two and add it to row one. And that should change the two to a zero. So this is the game plan. I'm not going to do it just yet. The next game plan is changing that to a zero. So what do I have to multiply this one by to get this to turn to a zero? Positive six. So I'm gonna do positive six times row two plus this bottom guy, which is row four, okay? Now, I'm gonna leave this matrix here because we're gonna need it when I have to write down my answers, okay? Because um, when you write your answer, it, you make a whole nother matrix and then you use that matrix to keep going. So you see what I mean by how like if you make mistakes, it can screw the whole thing up. OK, so you have to go carefully. I'm going to do the math over here. So all of these guys times negative two. So zero times negative two is still zero. That will turn into negative two, negative two, positive four and positive six. Then I'm gonna take row one and add it underneath. And so then I get one, zero. Oh wait, why did I do that? No, oh, yeah, that's good. Negative three, four, and eight. Okay, great. This is gonna be my new row what? It has to be the one that didn't get multiplied. 
right? So it has to be my new row one. Now let's go do the math for this one. So I'm gonna take all the guys from row two and multiply them by six. So zero times six, one times six, one times six, two, negative two times six, and then negative three times six. And I'm gonna take row four and put it right underneath. And so then I get zero, 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 negative 13, and negative 39. And this is gonna become my new row what? Four, good. So only thing that's changed is row one and row four. So when I write my new matrix, row one is gonna become this, Row two is staying exactly the same as it was. Row three is staying the same as it was. And then row four is going to be zero, 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 negative 13, negative 39. You see that so far? So now my second column is done, right? We're gonna move on to the third column you need to change this guy is the next one in that diagonal, right? He needs to change to a one. Changing things to a one is super easy. You just multiply the reciprocal of that number. And this is row three, right? So everybody's gonna stay the same. This is the annoying part. And this is the part where you cannot rush is rewriting this matrix. I cannot tell you how many times I've rewritten the matrix and I just forget a negative or put a wrong digit somewhere. One third times zero is zero. One third times zero is zero. One third times three is one. One third times negative three is negative one. And then negative six times one third is negative two. If you have to use the calculator to do that, go for it. It's not a big deal. Now I need to turn, I need to use this one to turn these guys into zeros. So I'm gonna write out my game plan, do my math, and then we'll go. So I'm gonna need a positive three then, aren't I? So you're gonna do positive three and you have to use the guy you just turned into a one. And that's in row three, isn't it? So it's positive three times row three plus the row one guy I wanna turn. So let's see, all of these guys, third row times a three. Zero, zero, a three, and negative three, and a negative six. And then row one, I'm gonna put right underneath. And so let's do the math. We get one, zero, zero, one, and negative, no, positive two. And this is gonna become my new row what? Row one, good. It's because I wanted that to be zero, right? So you should be replacing him. Now here I need, what does this guy need to turn into to eliminate that? This should be a negative one, right? And then it will eliminate the positive one. So I'm gonna do negative one times row three and add row two. So all these guys times a negative one. Zero, zero, negative one, positive one, positive two. And then row two goes underneath it. So I get zero, one, zero, negative one, negative one. And that's gonna be my new row what? Two. So let's write our new matrix. Row one is gonna turn into these numbers. Row two is gonna turn into these numbers. Row three and row four are not changing here. So I'm gonna keep from the previous line or the previous matrix. Oops, you can't see my numbers. Okay, now we can finally go on to the last column. So this should be the last few steps we need to do. How am I gonna change this into a one? 
I'm going to do the reciprocal, right? So 1 over the negative 13 times rho 4. I should have written it down there, but it's okay. I'll just shift my matrix up. 0 times that fraction is still 0, 0, 0. But negative 13 times this fraction is going to wipe it out and give me the 1. And then negative 39 times this is actually going to give me a positive 3. If you don't know for sure, just put it in your calculator. 39 negative times 1 fraction 3. Oops. 13. And I get 3. Okay. This calculator is weird, so don't pay attention to whatever you just saw. <laughs> Now, all the other guys, I'm not changing it. You only change them to the ones first, and then you can figure out what to do next. Don't try to do it all together. You'll end up writing the wrong rows, okay? So always get the one first, and then talk about how you get the zeros. So now that I have the one where I need it, oh man, I've got to turn all of these into zeros, don't I? That's three operations I got to do this time. Now, let's see, let's talk them out. This needs to, this guy needs to be what to get rid of that positive one? This should be a what? A negative one. So I'm gonna do negative one times four and add it to row one. Then the next operation, it's already the opposite, isn't it? So I'm just gonna do row two or oops, row four all by itself the way it is plus row two and then the last one row four plus row three should wipe out automatically as well now notice neither one of these is getting multiplied right but which one am i going to replace you're trying to turn that into a zero so it makes sense that i get a new row two right and you're trying to turn this into a zero aren't you so you should be replacing the row three so that you can fill it in with the zeros, okay? Here, there's no choice. You, you didn't multiply this guy by anything. So it has to be that guy, okay? Well, let's do the math. Actually, I don't even think I need to do a whole new matrix, the, the math on the side. If I take this times a negative and I add it to one, what do I get? Isn't it still zero plus one? If I multiply this by a negative, it's still zero plus zero is a zero. This times a negative is still zero plus this zero is a zero. This guy times a negative will give me negative one plus one gives me a zero. And then this times a negative gives me negative three plus two is a negative one. Do you see what I did? Okay, I only can do that when all I'm doing is changing the sign but if that had a number there, I have to do this, okay? And if you have to do that, even with the negative, do it. Go zero, zero, zero. This was negative one, negative three, and then one, zero, zero, one, two. And you'll get one, zero, 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 negative one. Same thing I got, okay? So if you can do them in your head, do it, but it, you have to be careful if you do it in your head. Now, these I'm just adding, so those are pretty easy. Um, four and two is zero, zero and one is one, zero and zero is zero, one and negative one is zero, three and negative one is positive two. Now the last one, add four and three together. So zeros, zeros, I get one, here I get zero. Hmm. No, yeah, I'm good. And then if I add those two together, I get one. Now row four, I haven't done anything to it. It should be the same. Zero, 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 one, and three. Do I have the matrix the way it needs to look? I do, right? So then we can go back and put it in the system. So the system says I have one X, no Y's, no Z's, no W's, equal to negative one. Here I have no X's, one Y, 
no Z's, no W's, equal to two. Here I have no X's, no Y's, a Z equal to one, and then nothing but a W equal to three. And I just wanna show you their answer. They did it a different way, but we got the exact same solutions, okay? They did the Gaussian elimination, which I told you is only like halfway than the real business, okay? I don't like to do that method. I just like to do the whole thing, just get it all done. Okay, let's see. So this page goes over there. I think this page, yes, goes over there. And then that. Okay. So where are we? We have literally just talked about the Gaussian Jordan method. So let's try. I think I'm out of time, aren't I? Yeah, I'm out of time. Okay. When we come back, we're gonna try example four from the 10.1 which is this system. So we're gonna try this one when we come back and then we'll head into the practice. And you have one, two, three practice problems. And then that's it. And I'll take a look at the homework to see if there's anything extra in 10.1 that we want to talk about before we go to 10.2. Okay. But we will get more practice with this one. You can try to do 10.1, but if I were you, I would wait. <laughs> so it's your choice. You can try to go in there and make some sense of it, or you can wait till we actually practice like quite a bit more because we've only done one giant one, right? Those are not what you're going to have to do. You don't have to do giant ones. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions over your your unit four report that I sent out or anything? Please make sure that you try to do those test corrections if you can, okay? But other than that, you guys have a great day.